بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. The back of praise to Allah and His praise and blessings be upon him, upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and his followers until the day of judgment. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by uh, always thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity, then thanking you for being here today. And I know it's um, an off day for so many of hardworking worker uh, and uh, being here today it shows one thing that how sincere you are inshallah ta'ala of learning uh, about your deen and I'll try to make this as simple as possible even though even though the concept of al-qada it's a it's a very easy concept but I found people make things complicated there is a statement uh, been, uh, been said by Ali ibn Talib when Allah he said once العلم نقطة كثرها جاهلون. العلم is a drop, but ignorant people may turn it to an ocean. Otherwise, the ilm is so simple. Al-Qadha was very simple. The, the people understood it and, and moved on with it. But today, there's a lot of people who made it so complicated. And I want to tell you something in advance. When I teach this concept, many times people tell me, that's it? I said, yeah, that's it. He said, no, it has to be harder than that. I said, no, it's not. It has to be more complicated than that. We have so many questions, we have so many doubts about it. I said, it's not. It's as simple as this, I uh, told you. And, and it's interesting, some people resist the simplicity of it. <laughs> you want it to be intentionally complicated. And you will see that Al-Qaeda is a concept that is very simple and it's very motivating. It's one of the, my favorite topics to speak about because every time I speak about Qadr, you don't know how much I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't know how much I'm so excited and so motivated to move on in my life and to grow and to be a better person. Al Qadr is an absolutely, uh, absolutely nothing but motivating, positive thinking, you know, uh, giving you a positive attitude towards life. Uh, and that's something, in my opinion, it's just an amazing thing uh, when you study the Aqidah, especially according to the way of Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah. Al Qadr, uh, believing in it, is one of the pillars of Iman. A believer will not be uh, a, a true or even a believer without believing in Al Qadr. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, once Jibreel came to him, and when Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he entered to the Prophet and gathered. And the Prophet was sitting, and since it's a workshop, it's not a lecture, I, I will be moving a little bit. So Nabi Sallallahu sitting like this. His knees on the, on the floor, and sitting like this. So Jibreel came and he sat exactly the same way, and he sat in a very strange way. He put, Jibreel came in the shape of a man. Nobody knows of this Jibreel. Just this man walk into the gathering. Can you imagine I'm sitting with you guys? All of a sudden, a man will come and will leave all the spot. Will come to the middle, straight to the to the Prophet and he sat right at the Prophet and he sat so close to the Sahaba said that this man's knees touching the Prophet's knees. Then he did something also interesting. He put his hands on his thigh. His referring to his own thigh or to the Prophet thigh. Two different opinions between the scholars. Some said, no, actually, he put the hand in the Prophet's on the thigh, which is making it more strange. You know, he put his hand on the Prophet's on the thigh, then he asked the Prophet. And even people were confused with this man because nobody knows who he is. Okay? And the, the community of Medina is like your community, very limited number. Anybody shut up, you, people know who he is. And he's not a traveler because he doesn't look like a traveler. His thawb, Umar said, is so clean, so nice. His hair is calm, it's clean, it's dark, it's not dusty. It's not, it's not somebody who comes just from the desert, a traveler. You know, there's no uh, Sheraton or millenniums to check in before coming to the masjid and freshen up? No. In Medina, you just 
there's no, if you're a stranger, it would be very easy to be identified by the way you look or by knowing that you're a stranger. So he said, Ya Muhammad, tell me what is an Iman? What is belief is? What is faith is? Then he said to him, to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the messengers, to believe in the qadr khayri wa shabri, and to believe in death and resurrection after death, and the hellfire and paradise, and the judgment. And another narration, he said, is to believe in the hereafter. The narrator summarizes it. Because sometimes the hadith is narrated by, or the hadith mostly narrated by the meaning. So sometimes the narrator will summarize and say the day of judgment, and something will break it actually, what exactly was mentioned. And both are authentic narrations, but the famous one is the summary one, which is the day of judgment. So here he said to believe in Al-Qadr, the good and the bad of it. Khayri wa shayri, the good and the bad of it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Inna kulla shayin khalaqnahu bi qadr. Everything we have made, it is made according to a qadr, a predestined. And you know, this universe, this universe is two things. Creator and creation. There's no third thing. It's either the creator or the creation. So if he said every creation is made based on qadr, it means everything in the world is made based on something it's already preordained, already planned, already basically known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in Tirmidhi 7, you will not be a believer until you believe in form. To believe that Allah is the only one worthy of worship and Muhammad sallallahu is last and final messenger and he was sent me with the truth and to believe in death and to believe in resurrection after death and to believe in Al-Qadr That's the hadith Also, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this hadith Muslim Ahmad he said if you spend as much as the mountain of Uhud, gold and silver for the sake of Allah Imagine a mountain of gold you spend all for the sake of Allah, good deeds It will not be accepted from you It will not be accepted from you Unless you believe Until you believe in al-qadr, the good and the bad And to realize and to believe and the mahtaka lam yakun yusiba. What it didn't happen to you. It didn't happen to you because Allah doesn't want it to happen. And what happened to you, it happened to you because Allah wanted to happen to you. It just didn't happen by chance. It didn't happen by, you know, it, it was already ordained that this will happen to you. And what didn't happen to you also ordained, because sometimes we don't think about that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not let so many things happen to you intentionally, and He intended that and He planned that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's many verses in the Quran speaking about how Allah creates things according to them, predetermined knowledge and uh, uh, determination of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The water met one another in the story of Nuh according to a perfect measurement and a, a, something that Allah ordained. What, what he means by the two or the waters met each other? Because how the flood happened during Noah? By two things. The water in the earth came out and the water in the sky came down. So it was raining so hard and it was basically the water gushing from the earth coming up, up from the earth and all the, the, the wells and rivers and, 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 and oceans which start flooding while also the rain coming so hard on people. So Al-Qadr, I'm sure you heard another word very famously, uh, a very famous word comes also Al-Qadr, which is, anybody can guess? Al-Qadr. Taqdeer, same word. Al-Qadha, very good. Al-Qadha, Al-Qadha, 
there's another word, very famous, it's called Al-Qada wal qada Historically speaking, historically speaking, this term Al-Qada wal qada never was used by Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. Actually, in the time of the Sahaba, the successor, the follower of the successors, for maybe several hundred years, this term never was used by Ahl Sunnah. The first people who used the term Al-Qada wal qada actually is not Sunnis. It was one of the sects, the deviant sects in Islam, who used these terms like this. But guess what? After those people start using al qada al qada it was commonly also used by the Sunni scholars. Can anybody tell me a lesson from this? Think about how open mind Ahl Sunnah are. Even though the terminology itself was initiated by someone who's not from Ahl Sunnah, but they didn't have a problem with using the terms as long as the terms is okay. We're not a closed-minded people because we have this kind of mentality today that there is people so close-minded. You know, they were absolutely that I were very open-minded and said, okay, that term is acceptable. The meaning is acceptable. These words are came in the Quran already, the Qaba and the word of Qadab, and it was used, but it was not a very common use later on. You'll find it in some of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah's work in the later time, like 500 Tijri and up. But before that, in the first early generation, they will not use the term al qada wa qada. They use al qada by itself or al qada by itself. And commonly, they use the word al qada. Actually, in the text, the text, the, 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 the Quran text or the Hadith text, you will not, you also see the use of the two words together al qada wa qada, like this. It's not even exist in the Quran, so the Prophet didn't use that term or Quran. Quran used the word al qada by itself or qada by itself. So, and it's important for me that you understand the meaning of these two words because I do believe that this is a key to understand the concept. And for English speaking or English speakers community, I always say there are certain terms in Arabic you must understand what the these words means in Arabic. Translation will not do justice to it. Okay? Predetermined, it does not represent the word qada. And that's one of the reasons for people to be misguided. Because they will start making the rules based on the translation. And the translation not necessarily reflecting the full meaning of the word. So you need to know what this word really means in Arabic. al qada or al qada so al-qada, qadar al-shay, in Arabic language, the words qadar, generally speaking, comes from the word qadar, which means new, predetermined, planned perfectly. So for example, it said, qadar al-shay, I plan. That's why engineers, and you know, they plan for, you know, uh, for things and how things will work and how it will fall. So all this taqdeer, you plan before things happen. And also you knew about it. So I knew that this will happen. Uh, the, 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 the knowledge that is prior to things, we call this taqdeer, okay? So it's planning, it is knowing, it is also predetermined. So I already predetermined that I will do something. We saw qaddaq al so these are the meanings of the word qada. The word qada, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the last name qadi and the job qadi, judge. Okay? So al qada, it means what? Executing. Okay? Making things happen. Making it exist. So qadait, that's why the qadi, why do we call the qadi qadi? Because he made the punishment happen. He make the rules happen. He apply the rules. Me and you, we can debate all day long about who will get what. But when it will take place, when the judge said, you take this and you take that. So he made it happen. So that's why al qada basically, linguistically, judged, ordained, executed perfectly. Question. Which one comes first? Qadr. Qadr comes first. So you make if you have qada, then qada. Even though like, like when we say al qada wa qada, it doesn't mean al qada comes first, okay? Al qada wa qada. It is because in Arabic language we 
don't like to end the sentence with heavy letter like a hamza. So we don't say al qadr wa qada. It's very heavy in, in pronunciation. We like to make it sound like relaxed so and say al qada wa qadr. Like that, so it's easy. And there is plenty of example like this in Arabic language. We we, we basically we don't care for the orders. We care of the way it it's sound. sound. You know, it's very common. Like you, for example, usul fiqh, we have something called al sabr al taqsim. You know, we have many examples like this. Anyway, uh, going back to the original point, um, so linguistically we see clearly a distinguish between the two words. But is that also how the Sharia uses the two words? The scholar analyzed every verse, every hadith, the word al qada al qadar came in. And they found something very interesting. They found that the word al qada al qada when it comes by itself, it could mean both. It could mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preordained something and also did something that Allah made it happen. The same thing with al-qada. It could mean knew something or predetermined something and also made it happen, executing something. <coughs> so they found out that the word al-qada wa qada can use as the awesomah and the other. But if they both come in one hadith, in one hadith, well, each one of them has a meaning. So Al-Qadr focused on the pre, and Al-Qadr focused on the existence of the things. Okay? Exactly like the word Sadaqah. The word Sadaqah could mean Zakat which is the obligatory money that you have to give to the poor to a category of people. That's right, salaq. إِنَّمَا الصَّلَقَاتُ الْفُقَرَاءِ the verse. But also, a salaqat means the volunteer donation. It's a volunteer act, it's not the obligation. So, the word salaqat could mean this or that. If you say a salaqat and a zakat, each one of them have a very specific meaning. But if you use sadaqah by itself, it could cover both meanings. Even the word zakat could cover both meanings as well. So it all depends on the context. But this is something like, if they come together, each one of them has a meaning. If they come separately, you know, they might cover each other. It's like the word Islam, Iman. Islam and Iman, put them together, Islam focus on the actions of the land. Salah, zakat. Iman focus on the action of the heart, to believe in Allah and the angel. Separate them, say, I am mu'min. It means I pray, I fast. It will include what Islam says, or what Islam means, okay? So there's, there's a lot of things like this. So you see that qada wa qada is the same concept, is the same concept. All what you need to do is to be careful and to look at the context and how it was used. Um, for example, if Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتُ He made them seven heavens. Here it means excluded. It's a word that exclusion of it. He basically did making it. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to dwell more in, into the linguistic and the technical definitions of them and, uh, and how some of that uh, some groups in history, they basically, uh, they said that they are synonymous to each other, there's no difference, this is not something I will go into it now. But what is important for me is to define al-qadr wa al according to the Sharia. So, what, we know linguistically al-qadr means al-qadr, but what that means in Sharia, what that means in the theology, the scholar said, Al-Qadr means, and, and pay attention, Allah's complete knowledge, writing in the same tablet, and willing of all things before their existence. So this is Al-Qadr, it means that Allah's knowledge of everything, and everything Allah knows of, He wrote in the same tablet. 
and this writing and this knowledge according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah willed it in the past before its exists. So Allah willed that you will be born. Well, that I will come to Kuwait. Well, that you will be here in this class. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew that you will go to this college. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already willed it and, you, and He wrote at the same time that you're going to buy, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what are they call uh, Buy, for example, uh, a, a house or a car. So everything is new, written, and willed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And willed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they saw this is what Al-Qanam is. And you can tell the connection between this definition and the linguistic meaning of the word al But what's Al-Qaba? Al-Qaba in Sharia is said. It means Allah's creation of all things by His command and will. So it's Allah's creation. So Allah created, made it. So Allah knew that this baby will be in the womb of the mother. He wrote that. He willed that. But when the moment comes for this egg to meet the sperm and the child to be exist, Allah will say, be. And it will be exist in the mother womb. When Allah decides that this is the time for you to be born, be, and you will be born, and you will lose life, whatever, be sick, be healed, whatever the issue is. Okay? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He make it executed, make it happen according to His will and by His command. So Allah, يَخْلِقُ بِأَمْرِ subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, that He is the creator of everything. That's the, 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 the technical definition of the Al-Qaba wa al qalam Where this technical definition came from? It came from something we call the pillars of Al-Qadar. And here I'm going to need to say Al-Qaba al qadar every time. So Al-Qadar will include both. And this is something also a key point to understand the concept. Everything that is exists Everything, and I mean everything, it has to go through five stages. We call this the pillars of the qadr. Anything you can imagine in this world happened, and it will happen, it has to go through these pillars, or these five pillars, or based on these five pillars, or if you want to say, it goes through these five stages. Number one, the first pillar of the qadr, and is the most important one of it, it's called ilmullah, the knowledge of Allah. And guess what? It is so important to the extent when Imam Ahmad was asked, what is Al-Qadr? He said, Al-Qadr is Allah's knowledge. And Imam Shafi'i Allah said, if anyone, anyone argue with you about Al-Qadr, argue with them about Al-Ilm. فَإِنْ أَثْبَتُوهُ if they agree with you that Allah has the perfect knowledge, they can't argue with you anymore. And if they deny that Allah has the perfect knowledge, they are not Muslims. Because no Muslim ever will say Allah doesn't have knowledge. But what do we mean by Allah's knowledge? We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything before it happened, while it is happening, and after it happened. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, Allah knows everything that before it happened, everything while it is happening, while it is happening. Then he knows it after it happened. That's it? No. There is even more. More than that? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the things that it never happened. If it happened, how it will be. Guys, this is something beyond your imagination. This is something you can't, you can't even imagine that. Can you think, if anyone here in business, I know you are, 
Okay? The also business they teach you how to calculate risk and all scenarios. Things if it if it happened this way, how you can plan for it. Can you imagine what are the possibilities exist? For anything that happened to you, if it didn't happen, or other things can might happen to you. All this known to Allah, that whatever not happened to you, if it happened, how it will be. Yani for example, Allah knows if you never came to Kuwait, and you accept another job, another country, how your life will be. With all the details of it. Allah knows if you never choose that career, or choose that spouse, or choose that basically house, or choose that decision, or choose that work, or that, how this life will be. That's just unbelievable amount of knowledge. There is no human being, there is nothing in the world can come any close to this. This is beyond your imagination. And just knowing everything in this world in itself is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's just knowing it before it happened and why it's happening and after it happened. That's why Allah SWT said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا That Allah SWT surrounded everything with His knowledge. And listen to how Allah described his knowledge. He knows all the unseen, the thing that you don't know, you'd never see. And he knows what is in the land and what's in the sea. Can you imagine if you go to the bottom? You know, go outside to the bottom and look at the sands, how many grand sands exist in Kuwait. How many rocks and how many trees exist in the world? How many creatures in the earth in the earth and how many creatures in the sea? That little ant that carried his you know, provisions and, uh, and born and died and insects and, and look at the bacteria, look at the viruses, look at the stars and the moons and the universe. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Then he said to you an example. Just one example he tells you. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Not a single leaf tree fall unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Knows when this leaf tree will turn to brown, will dry out, when it will fall off the tree, and where it will settle in the ground. And where it will settle in the ground. And this is, the, you know, uh, can I remember this verse maybe when you travel outside Kuwait? Because in Kuwait, there's, you know, in Gulf area, in the Arabia, it's, we still have a lot of trees. But just if you want to see the magnificence of this, go to a country's or area, like in Africa or in North America or in Europe or in Asia, where like forests. And just look at these trees, how one day storm comes and how when the autumn comes and how when those leaves fall. It's amazing. He knows where every single leaf lies. And not a single seed. Because when the wind comes blow, you know, carry the leaves and carry the seeds. In any place in the darkness of the land or the darkness of the sea, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where is it. Can you imagine this is just to show you, to give you a picture of the amount of knowledge that he has. But what about, so he knows it before it falls, he knows it while it's falling, I said to you, he knows things before it happened, why it's happening, and after it happened. But what about, he knows things never happen. Yes, there's examples of that. Many examples, but I give you some. Or maybe one example because of the time. Allah SWT said in the Quran, Allah 
ولا نكذب بآيات ربنا ونكون من المؤمنين بل بدا لهم ما كانوا يخفون من قبل ولو ردوا لعادوا لما نهوا عنه وإنهم لكاذبون الله سبحانه وتعالى of the day that will say, oh Allah, give us eternal chance. Take us back to this life, to the life of the dunya, and we will change the course of our life. We will be good, we will be straight, we will be righteous, we will worship you, we will be good believers. Ya Allah, let us give us this chance. Allah, what He said about them, He said they are liars. Question, when you say they are liars, you might say, how come they are liars? Did they go back and they didn't do what they promised to do? They didn't. So why are they called them liars? Because Allah said, If I will give them the chance to go back to life, they will go back to do the same bad actions. Then Allah said they are liars. Because for Allah, what didn't happen is equal to what happened. His knowledge of what happened is equal to his knowledge of what didn't happen. For us, our knowledge of what didn't happen is not equal to the knowledge of what happened. That's why right. you calculate risk, you're not 100% sure. You know, maybe this happened. I can't really be 100% sure. Allah doesn't have guess what. He knows what never happened. If it happened, how it will be. And it's full knowledge. If you understand this is the nature of Allah, so that's why whenever you say, how Allah knows I will do this and I will do that, because that's how His nature, His nature that He knows the future. His nature that He knows what will happen. What is your destiny is? Where are you going to end up? What will happen in the day of judgment? He knows that. And that's why the Quran speaks about the day of judgment with the past tense. As if it happened already. Why? Because for Allah, it doesn't really make a difference if it happened or it will happen. Because He is absolutely sure of both. And it will happen exactly the same way. There is no prediction. There is no guessing. It's an absolute knowledge. Not only that knowledge, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wrote everything in the book. Like the writing, why the writing? Because the writing demonstrating the complete knowledge. So he knew it, then he made the writing to happen. This writing happened before the creations of the heavens and the earth. In Sayyid Muslim, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he could, said that Allah created the pen, a pen. And he took the that pen, which is Allah made. It's a creature we do not know how it looks like. Exactly. But Allah told that pen, write. He said, what should I write? He said, write what will happen until the day of judgment. And it's called the safe tablet. Why is safe tablet? Safe because nobody can read from it. Nobody can have access to it. It's safe from everywhere. Nobody can change it. Nobody can write in it, nobody can erase from it anything. It is protected and safe. And in the other hadith, the Nabi Sallallahu said to Allah that this safe tablet is next to Allah's throne, in the, in the arch. It's not, that's why we as Ahl Sunnah, we don't believe that no one has access to the, when somebody tell you, oh, Sheikh Jilani or Sheikh Ibn Riyaj, he reads from the safe tablet, and Allah gave him access to it to confirm and to erase whatever he wants from it, we don't accept that, because it's not safe anymore. And believe me, there is people who say stuff like this. Anyway, so we know that everything is written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what will happen in the future. But also, and I want you to remember this because we're going to use it later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also might write the qadr, what will happen, in other books, other than the safe tablet. Because Allah has made many different records for the qadr. The mother of all book is the safe tablet. But also He made 
some other records, for example, every year in Laylat al Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yufraqu fiha kullu amrin hakim. In that night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide in it Allah is wise matters according to Jesus. So He will tell the angel in that night, Laylat al Qadr, right, who will make hajj, who will die, who will live, who will this, who will that. And they will write this in their white books. Also, when you are 120 days old in your mother womb, Allah sent an angel and He will send an angel right in your book that this person is Shaqi and Sa'id. I know they do dinner, people have fun. This person provisions. This person life span. How long he will live or she will live. Okay? So these also, a small record, contain partial information about you. No detail. Just these statements or these basic conclusions. But the safe tablet is detailed with everything that Walid would be picked at 4 o'clock by Hajrafi, you know, and Walid would be late for 10 minutes, you know, or 6 <laughs> minutes, and Hajrafi was over speeding and speed limit in his car, you know. <laughs> no, it's a joke. And we come, and it's written that the microphone will not work, and until, until the you know, man comes and help, and the sisters will move from this side to that side. Everything written that this is exactly happened. If, if you have this in a movie, and you look at it, and you read it in the book, you see the exact same one. That's what's written in the safe Everything in details. And to de demonstrate the absolute knowledge of Allah. Tayyip. Then, the third pillar, it's called the will of Allah. The will of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will things, willed it. He willed it before it exists, and He willed it while it exists. So Allah willed everything in general, and when the time for this baby to go, when the time for this things to happen, when the time for this person to be healed, to be sick, to die, to get the money, whatever is basically prescribed upon the person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment willed it at that moment to happen. So whatever was written will happen now. Whatever was known determined will happen right now. Inna ila so So this Iraq in this world comes in the time when Allah make the order for things to be exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, He wrote everything in the past. Everything in the past. And, well, and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applies to what exists and what's not exist. So it's not exist because he never willed it. If Allah willed, he will guide all human beings, but he never willed that. So not all human beings guided because Allah never willed it that way. So it is it, the Mashiach and the will. It has to do with what exists or what's not exist. Also, there is another one which is an amr, the command of Allah, which is be and to be exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And so there is this verse 82, in the Ma'amru Ida Arab Shayna Yakur Allahu Kun Fayakur. And the last pillar of Al Qada, the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah Khaliku Kulli Shay. Allah is the creator of everything. So there is nothing in this world unless it was created by Allah. No one created anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If if we understand this, I don't know how big your memory is. But if you allow me, I want to take you back to the definition of a qadr. Okay? You remember what I said about what's the definition of a qadr? What a qadr is? And a qadr, basically, we said, is Allah's complete knowledge, writing in the safe tablet, and willing of all things before their existence. How many pillars of Al-Qadr in this definition? Three. The knowledge, the writing, and the will. 
and the qada, the creation of everything, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation of all things, by His command and His will. How many? Two. Creation of Allah, command and will, three. And we said that Qadr's pillar are five. But if you notice, the will goes on both. Because there is a will general before the existence of everything, and there is a world that comes with the existence of the creation. That's why the world goes on both. So that's how the definition came by looking at the pillars of Al Qadr. Before I go farther, if somebody here in the crowd tell me, Shaykh Walid Allah, before you go further, didn't the Prophet said, and this hadith is authentic, he said, I think also Ibn Hibban reported the hadith. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the subject of Al Qadr brought up, then withhold from speaking about it. Khabs, let's go home. Do the whole sound of He said, you can give us like headache, talk about like the whole Qadr. The Prophet said, the Qadr subject brought up, withhold. So don't talk about it. Khabs, why are you are shepherding giving us four hours lectures about the Qadr? This hadith, give us a break. We say, no, this hadith does not say or suggest that we don't study al Qadr. Because al Qadr is one of the pillars of Iman. And we in order to understand our Iman and our, our faith, our religion. But what this hadith means, this hadith has also continuation. There is another portion of it which is maybe an unholy word. The Prophet said, if my companion were mentioned, withhold from speaking about them. When the stars are mentioned, withhold from speaking about it. Are we allowed to study the life of the companion? Yes. Are we allowed to study the stars and the space? Yes. So why is it withhold? The Prophet was said, we are not allowed to talk about the companion in a negative way, in a wrong way. We cannot have a class here next time I visit Kuwait. Hey, the class will be, let's compare to the companion. Let's see who is better. Mu'ad or Khalid bin Walid. Let's see what are the best, who is the best. This one or that one. Let's do a comparison. We don't talk about the Sahaba this way. We don't talk about their mistakes and their, you know, what they did right or wrong. No, we learn from them. We speak about them in the most honorable, respected way. But we don't talk about it then in a negative way. We don't talk about the stars, and we talk about the stars and it influences your psychology. And it, you know, you are born in this month and this is stars, it means you're gonna lose weight, it means you're gonna gain less. We don't talk about stuff like that. But we talk, we study star in the right way, we study this in the right way. Al Qadr, we don't talk about the Qadr by questioning Allah. Ya why Allah made it seven heavens? Why Allah made the earth seven heavens? Why Allah made this? And we start questioning Allah. That's not allowed. Because you can't even comprehend the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't challenge God. Because you know nobody who you are to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or to claim that you're in a position to judge His action. Or you're in a position to claim that you have an equal understanding of things like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No way. So, um, that's, that's what this hadith means. Also, there's another point I skipped, and I'm not going to spend much time on it. Al Qadr is a subject where I can tell you every single sect in Islam went astray. A lot of sects in certain Hadith and Aqeedah they go with Ahl Sunnah, but this subject in particular. I am not aware of any sects in Islam unless they couldn't get it right. Regardless how far they are from Ahl Sunnah or close to Ahl Sunnah. But mainly there's two groups, and I want you to understand the two groups so you understand where we stand. There is one group go all the way to that wall, okay, outside, and they are extreme in affirming Al Qadr. Extreme in affirming to the extent that they said that Al Qadr control everything, that you have no will, you have no power, you have nothing. You, you, 
the, the, the only will, the only action exists on earth is Allah's actions, is Allah's power, is Allah, is the fact. You are absolutely have no say. They said human beings with Allah is like a feather in the wind. The wind flippants and takes it in any direction and the feather has no control. He said you human being like that. So they are very extreme in affirming qada and the expense of canceling any role for the human being. And the most known as Jabriya and the most basically group of them called al Jahmiya, historically known as al Jahmiya, follower of the Jamal Safar, who died 746 or Hijri 128. He was executed because of his belief. And um, if you trace this idea, it goes back to a Jew in Medina who promoted the idea known as the Deen ibn al as Imam al Bukhari, and others said. Okay. Do I have 50 seconds? 50 seconds. Okay. Because I don't want to keep these guys on the other side handy. The other group on the other side, okay, so you got this side, and the other group on the other side are extreme in denying Allah. It's the complete opposite. They said, very extreme in denying They said, no, 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 no. We cannot say that Allah is the door of everything. We cannot say that Al Qadr is control. Because that means, because Believe it or not, in history, there is people said all crime, all evil, all indecency, all indecency happened, Allah is responsible for it. Ibn Kathir said that there were a time, villages, when a man, he will see his family member fornicating, in doing the haram, and get angry. His wife or his daughter will say, why? This is Allah's decree. Then he said, Amen to Billah. I believe in Allah's decree and he leaves the house. That's how extreme it happened. In the other side, a reaction. They said, no, 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 no. Deny al qadr And the denial of al qadr took two levels. One level, which is happening in the end of the time of the Sahaba. They said, you know what? Allah even doesn't know about things until it happens. And that happened during Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar time, and he said, tell such people that they are kuffar, they are not Muslims. <coughs> and he said, Allah doesn't know the Islam. Then this is, no Muslim would ever agree that Allah is ignorant. So what happened is another group said, no, he knows about it, but he never created it. He knows about it, but he never created it. And with this, Start to pray Maghrib, but this explains to you why it's important to say the pillars of the Quran because it deals with these extreme groups.